Please be seated. As I was preparing to come back to St. Martin's this week after my paternity leave, I was maybe more than ever before aware of context. The context being my return after an absence off and on for most of the summer, a context of having experienced probably the most wonderful time of my eventful life, the welcoming of a newborn human being into my family and into the world, Emma. And at the same time, some interesting and profound challenges of the sort that life often throws our way. Really, for me, the context this morning is the enormity and the beauty of this whole human journey and experience that is God's free and loving gift to us all. Now, early in the week, when I read the lectionary to think about what I would preach about this Sunday, I was sort of hoping for a relatively simple group of straightforward lessons. And then I read what we heard this morning, three of the, the most theologically rich uh, and interesting passages imaginable, each material enough for several whole sermons unto themselves. First, God is appearing in the burning bush of Exodus. Moses, an unindicted murderer on the run from the law, is hiding out in a foreign land. And he is confronted by the creator of all in the form of a burning bush. And he is told that he will not only go back to where he is a wanted criminal, but that he will lead a slave revolt when he gets there in the name of I am, the God of the universe and of all existence. Few ideas in there to unpack. Then Paul gives us what to me is probably the best description of a compassionate, functioning, workable, and decent society that I have ever heard. One almost, frankly, unthinkable to us right now as 21st century humans. A place where love among its people is common, genuine, affectionate, and prizes honor and harmony. Where the good is defined by contributing to the needs of another and where strangers are welcome, where those who don't see eye to eye still bless one another and folks celebrate and mourn together in common humanity, where humility is a real and prized virtue, the exalted commingle with the lowly and no one pretends ownership of wisdom, where revenge and vengefulness are rejected for the pointless and bitter destructions that they are, where friends and enemies alike are fed and listened to, where evil is not overcome with more evil, but with love. Weird, even impossible sounding sometimes for us. But this is Paul's version of God's vision for us and how we ought to be together. And then finally in our gospel, the most distilled, concentrated definition of discipleship that Jesus ever gives us. Deny yourselves and pick up your cross or whatever it is in your life that is capable of killing off your self-centeredness the way my cross did mine and follow me. It's a lot to hear at 9.30 in the morning. I know. So as I thought about this treasure trove, of mystery and truth and comfort and challenge, I kept returning to a fascinating talk I heard by Dr. David Eagleman, a very smart neuroscientist. Has anybody here ever heard of the deep field observation experiment of the Hubble telescope? I knew you two had. (laughs) Well, it's pretty fascinating. In 2003, NASA decided to point the Hubble telescope at a little dark patch of the night sky with no stars visible, about the width of a pencil tip held at arm's length. They wanted to see if they took took this extremely powerful telescope and pointed it where there didn't seem to be anything for a very long time, if they might pick up some light and see a star out there. So for 400 times, 400 revolutions of the Earth, every time the Hubble telescope orbited the Earth, its lens focused for about 20 minutes on this spot, this tiny speck of space. 
And when they finally crunched all the data, they didn't see a star. They saw over 10,000 galaxies, each with around 100 billion stars in it. So that's a thousand trillion stars just like our sun with innumerable solar systems and planets and God only knows how many forms of life that we cannot even imagine. Now that's just a glimpse of what's hidden and teeming in this tiny little patch of this universe or multiverse that God has created. Now this is mind-boggling stuff. Now, Eagleman is a scientist, and I am a mere priest. But we both agree that this is best understood as a consciousness raiser about the size and enormity of the vast mysteries that surround us. Also, just as importantly, a testament to our own limited knowledge and understanding. A cause truly, my friends, for a little humility. For me, it's also profoundly just a glimpse into how God's kingdom looks and works and it's literally endless possibility we can only dream about. And it bears directly on the lessons that we heard today. To play out the metaphor, imagine that the night sky with all of its beauty and half-revealed and half-hidden stars and worlds is us. And that in this instance, the Hubble telescope is God's love, able to collect the trickles of light, the photons of potential, if you will, from parts of us that we don't even know about or are barely conscious of. In that sense, what happened to Moses makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that a man born a Jew, raised an Egyptian prince, hiding out as a fugitive and a goat herder in a distant land, would be drawn by God to a mountaintop and charged with being God's spokesman to free his chosen people from slavery. Moses, with his speech impediment and proven cowardice, he ran away from his crime, let's remember, didn't see himself this way, can't see the depths within depths within himself, but God does. And though it's a familiar scene to us, We should never forget the moment of sheer terror and confusion that Moses must have felt as he stood alone in the bright, frightening presence of a burning bush speaking to him. And how it brought forth in him a new being, a new power and presence in the world through the power of God's spirit and call to him. God's love, seen as a powerful telescope looking into our deepest, most depths and capacities, also makes this impossible world of justice, peace, and equality described by Paul suddenly possible. I agree, of course, that relying merely on our own humanity, our bright ideas, and under our own steam, it is highly unlikely that anything like this generous, loving, mutually of building and life-affirming society is possible. But God sees it. God describes it. God shows it. He sent his son Jesus Christ to describe and demonstrate what it looks like. And we just saw glimpses of it in Houston, Texas where people of all kinds and backgrounds were helping other people from all kinds of backgrounds to safety, often without concern to themselves, for themselves, where some individuals died trying to save others in an extraordinary demonstration of self-sacrifice. In the midst of human violence and stupidity in our world, it is still filled with such decency and love in action. God sees it, and we can too if we, if we allow our hearts and minds to be drawn to it. And lastly, in this gospel today, after describing to his horrified friends what will happen to him, his own excruciating execution, Jesus tells them they have to be prepared to do the same thing. If anyone, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Well, if we read this carefully and honestly, 
it can really sound too demanding, just too much for us. But God sees strength and goodness deep inside us in ways that we cannot see for ourselves until we look. What Jesus seems to be saying is that in this life something is or will be capable of destroying us, execute us, either figuratively or in reality, and that through God's love and only through God's love, that very thing, that challenge or fear or illness or addiction or dishonesty or fraud can be transformed into the very vehicle of our redemption into a new life, just as the cross the instrument of execution was for Jesus. And you don't have to make it up. We don't have to make it up as we go along. And we're never alone. Jesus already did this, already showed and pointed the way. But here's the thing. It won't be easy. It's hard living into the whole, complete, healthy and loving person God created us to be. It's going to mean getting radically and really honest. It's going to mean sacrificing part of ourselves and our lives that is, in fact, possibly destroying us or hurting us or our relationships in the world around us. Now, you've heard me say that, you know, to me, the idea that there's somehow a contradiction between God and science is one of the goofiest ideas I've ever heard. And where Dr. Eagleman and I agree most is that what this is all about is a journey of exploration. For the scientists, it's about continuing to peel back the layers of the physical world to continually discover its inner workings and reality, to lift the hood on this creation. For us, as Jesus followers, it also means a journey and an exploration into peeling back the layers of ourselves and our relationship with God and the possibilities they hold for new, refreshing, and unending life. Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is what we're on toward faith and love and wholeness and the purpose of serving God's promises and God's world. Now it's September and this community is just embarking on this New Year's pilgrimage in the weeks and months together, to a truly holy place that God envisions for us. Just know that we may be moving toward things that we are only dimly aware of, that we don't fully understand, but that through God's grace, they can open whole new worlds of peace and joy and hope. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.